Safety Foundation, the City of Los Angeles Commission for Children, Youth, and Families, working for Supervisor Molina, and First Five. So when he's talking from DC or talking about some of the local issues, he's been there and done that and been in the trenches. So we are so grateful to have you here. Thank you, Regina. Welcome. For having me. Thank you. So why don't you tell us about your path to the White House and then let's hear about the perspectives from DC. Sure, sure. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, I, Regina and I had a conversation on Friday afternoon. I feel like it might have been 5.30 my time, so 2.30 your time. And we agreed that in the spirit of the themes of the conference, right, risk taking and meeting of the minds and courage, that we were not going to do like a keynote speech and that we were actually going to have a conversation and that she wasn't going to tell me the questions she was going to ask, but that I would have, literally, literally, that's a risk professionally, <laughs> uh, but that I would um, just offer some few thoughts and then we'd just have a conversation and then really open it up to you so you can ask questions and we can have a really con big conversation here. So um, a little bit about um, sort of a quick working backwards. So I am the president's nominee to serve as the next commissioner of the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families, which is a long title for uh, the nation's um, official who's responsible for all of the federal money in foster care, homeless youth programs, and domestic violence programs, and runaway programs, and pretty much the, the vulnerable of the vulnerable, right, for kids. And my whole career has been shaped by work on children, youth, and families. And I would say that uh, my path to the White House is one that um, is dramatically shaped by my own experience and sort of being able to weave and integrate my own personal experience um, is, is the work of a lifetime, and I think all of us have those experiences, either personally in your own immediate family or with neighbors or with friends. But for me, you know, I get to be at the White House as the son and grandson of migrant farm workers, um, of farm workers, of uh, janitors, of landscapers and gardeners, of dishwashers, of cooks, of nannies. And I am the first in my family to graduate from high school, from college, from graduate school. The first to um, have been elected to, to office in the place where I grew up and was raised in Watsonville, California, up north. So if you ever eat Driscoll's raspberries or strawberries or blackberries, they were picked um, by people like my mother and, um, and my family and friends, right? And if you ever drink Martinelli's apple cider, you know, which was literally made across the street from my high school in the 1860s, um, and lots of people pick those apples and turn them into, to this day, Martinelli's sparkling apple cider, right? And uh, I always say that if you've tasted, you know, Martinelli's apple cider, you've tasted my town. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, that's sort of the framework in which I sort of approach the work. Um, and, um, and I've also really interestingly been on sort of both sides of the, of, of the not both sides, but multiple sides of cross-sector engagement. So when Bob was talking about you know, sort of him navigating being a physician in a medical system and then thinking about um, uh, his work in government, you know, I've been on the staff side. So I've been you. I've had to be the staff person writing the memo that goes to the ED. I've been the ED. I've been a founding executive director. Um, I helped launch First Five San Francisco County right after Proposition 10 was launched. We were one of the, the first six counties in the entire country to launch universal health care for children at 250% of federal poverty level without regard to citizenship status. And uh, Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, these were all little tiny counties up there compared to LA, right, the largest in the country. But um, so I, I know what it's like to have to raise money and to hire people and fire people and evaluate your programs uh, and also sort of be a policy analyst, right, and actually have to propose real solutions to things that I'm willing to work on. Um, so the path has been a twisted and windy one, right? I mean. I think that the biggest lesson I've learned is that absolutely every one of you could also be sitting in my chair. And I didn't know that until I got to the White House. Um, and when I first got the call to join the team, um, I was going to be sitting on two different teams. So the White House Domestic Policy Council, so all things in the country, domestic issues, are part of that team. So, you know, ju juvenile justice issues, um, you know, what happens to unaccompanied children once they cross the border, education policy. So I, I'm on a team that works on what you heard in the State of the Union around child care proposals and universal access to preschool. That was a team that I sit on. Um, My Brother's Keeper. Um, I was on the, I've been on the team from the beginning. Um, and then I contrast that or balance that with the work on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. 
I'm having this moment of like cultural dissidence because there's this thing in Spanish, no dar la espalda, which means not to give your back to someone. And so I'm trying to turn my chair because I don't <laughs> want to give anyone my back. My mother would be mortified. <laughs> and uh, it's one of those things, like I feel like I'm giving you the back and I look over here. Um, important cultural nuances, right? Every culture has got its thing and you're not supposed to ever give someone your back, right? And so uh, that's sort of an apt symbol for the work, which is that the idea is that, and why I believe so strongly in this president and this first lady in this administration, is that they believe to their core that we as a country shouldn't give our backs to anybody. So I'm curious, when you made the shift to Washington, D.C., how did what you learned with Gloria Molina? You mm. were certainly on the <laughs> county side, and then all of a sudden, was it harder, easier? To, how does that change right. when you get to the, the very top? Well, you know, it's, uh, so for those of you, like I'm just curious, raise a hand. How, how many of you have ever worked for federal government, even if it's locally, okay? So a couple percentage points. How many of you have only worked at the local government level? Raise your hand. County, state, only nonprofits. Okay. So uh, interestingly, and everyone in this room knows that the how desperately they're interconnected and how their fates are intertwined, right? So if you're applying for a city grant, the city of Norwalk, for example, and you are providing human services, one of the few of the 88 incorporated cities in the county of Los Angeles, right? Try explaining that to someone on the East Coast. You know, you could put many states in the county of LA, and the economy of Los Angeles and the economy of California is enormous, right? It's a global powerhouse. So thinking about those lessons, I, when I worked in Los Angeles, I had never worked for a place as big as LA, because you, you can't work for any place as big as LA. There's just no, nothing compared to it. Same with the federal government. You can't work at anything that big, so if and when I ever get confirmed, so I had my confirmation hearing a few weeks ago, the Senate has to confirm me. We don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, <laughs> seriously, right? And so I will never have ever led a budget of billions and billions and billions of dollars because there's no other comparison. And that's what it felt like with LA County to the, state, to the federal government, which is that until I came and worked here, I had no idea the, scale, the scope and scale and the power of this place. And I was telling Regina or someone over breakfast when we were earlier that the first thing I had to work on when I arrived in Gloria's office was the Martin Luther King Hospital fiasco. And I literally, uh, we had moved across country, I'd finished graduate school, my wife was pregnant with her first baby, um, we were trying to find a place to live at the height of the boom of housing here. We must have put in, I don't know, 17 bids for houses, right? Outbid with cash all over the place. I mean, and we bid everywhere in LA County. And I walked in, and I, I had been following the paper after I'd gotten a job and following what was happening at MLK. And I was like, this cannot be as bad as I'm reading. And then I walked into the hospital, and then I'm sort of a walker, talker kind of manager, so I would like, I wanted to just walk around the complex. And um, I was just embarrassed for our country at what I saw. And my thought was, over the arch of the lifetime of that hospital, what happened across every single level of staff, volunteer, professional, patient, that allowed what happened there to happen? There was complacency at multiple levels, right? The Board of Supervisors wasn't the only person, people responsible, and she was the chair of the board. And I learned more about you know, antibacterial issues in the air duct systems, which was a problem there, right? Think about it, how you breathe good air in a hospital matters visiting how uh, prescriptions would, were supposed to go from a floor to the pharmacy and the breakdown in that so that patients could get their bills on time, visiting the place that was sort of the orphanage or the pediatric ward in that hospital and looking at the, what were essentially baby jails, like these bars uh, where kids were and like watching stuff like, you know, vomit and feces on the wall. And I thought to myself, like how do we, not them, how do we let that happen in America. And in my role at the White House, because we wear many, many hats, we sort of all have to roll up our sleeves and make things work, I take all those lessons with me, like whether it's the, the enormity of LA County or the small agricultural town that is Watsonville, California. And so I feel like every time I'm at a table, it is my duty to bring all those experiences and be willing to upset people for it. 
And I think that as I'm reading in the Times now, MLK is reopening, and there's lots of interesting data analysis of, the, of the, the, the spikes in use of emergency rooms in LA County, right, and where those were, and what's going to happen. And I think to myself, more than any of those stories, more than any of the data, one has to ask yourself, both here if you live here, as well as anyone else in the country, how do we never let that happen ever again? Because the people of South LA and the people of this country deserve so much more than, than the fiasco that that hospital was. So one of the things that you and I were talking about is that there are examples around the country where maybe somebody was brave, mm -hmm. maybe somebody took a risk, but change is happening. Mm -hmm. Are there, we were talking about the sort of parallel universe of where folks look at LA and certainly as Bob talked about, looked at California as an opportunity to experiment. And that maybe sometimes around the country, mm -hmm. um, they learn from us. Mm -hmm. Are there some examples? I'm curious if we're thinking about how to lead change, if there are some examples that you would really like to highlight. Um, there are. And, and, and what I, what, the couple of things I did write down is I actually want to, I don't want to misquote the president of the first lady, but I want to read something to you. Um, <laughs> we it's important to get the, the <laughs> boss's words right, right? So. Um, the, one of the teams that I've worked on at the White House um, is called Retire, the First Lady's Initiative to increase the number of first-generation college-going students to go to college. And in that process, learning a lot about what many of you have probably learned about either yourselves or through your family, which is oftentimes just knowing what a FAFSA form is, which is a required form to get federal student aid. Many Americans don't even know that they can qualify for aid. You know, or if they do get into college, showing up that first day of college, because if they're the first generation to do that, they don't know that sometimes certain forms are due at certain times to get housing or your sheets or whatever, right? And so she was uh, one of the, she recently uh, had this competition because they get asked to speak at commencements all the time, and so she used the power of you know the White House and social media to challenge uh, Americans to tell her their stories of how they're engaging low-income students across the country to get FAFSAs in on time and to get kids to go to college. So that was an interesting innovation using Vine and Twitter and uh, Tumblr. And, she, and the, one of the colleges that won around how they're engaging low-income students is, was Oberlin College. And she did a commencement speech there just a few weeks ago. And if you get a chance, Google you know, First Lady Michelle Obama, Oberlin, and watch it. It's 20 minutes or so. But I want to talk about one piece of her speech to answer that particular question, because I knew this would come in handy somewhere in our conversation. <laughs> so she's talking about sort of the, the um, she's there uh, at the time that is the, 20, the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's commencement speech at Oberlin. And Oberlin was the first college in the country to admit African-American students, the first in the country. Um, and she talks about sort of that, that historical significance and talks about sort of the noise that's happening in the country, right? And so I'm going to read this because I think it's really important and it's powerful. So she says, and in the face of all of that clamor, the noise, right, you might have an overwhelming instinct to just run the other way as fast as you can. You might be tempted to just recreate what you had here at Oberlin, to find a community of like-minded people and, um, and work with uh, them on causes you like uh, and just tune out all the noise. And that's completely understandable. In fact, sometimes I have that instinct myself. <laughs> but today, graduates, I want to urge you to do just the opposite. Today, I want to uh, encourage that if you really wish to carry on the Oberlin legacy of service to social justice, then you need to run to and not away from the noise. Today, I want you <clears throat> uh, to seek out the most contentious, polarized places you can find, because throughout our history, those have been the places where minds have changed, lives transformed, where our great American story unfolds. And when I think about um, you know, a black woman standing at Oberlin 50 years later, where Martin Luther King stood, the first college in the country to admit African-American students, and you think about pockets of innovation, the fact is they're happening all over the country. And the future is now, meaning there are many of you in this room are actually doing something extraordinary or courageous or risk-taking or innovative, but you're not, we don't know about it. 
and we're not necessarily using the new tools that we have available to us. So one might argue, what would Cesar Chavez's movement be like if he had Twitter, right? What would Gandhi's movement be like if he had Facebook or Snapchat? And, and that might sound frivolous, right, for a second. But the idea is that this innovation is happening in your organization. It's happening in your boardrooms, believe it or not. It's happening amongst your staff. It's happening amongst each of you. But the question becomes, how do we act on those ideas? And so a few quick examples uh, that I think would surprise people. So we um, put together the President's White House Summit on Early Education, and we had it last December. It was the first um, early education summit that happened at the White House in many, many uh, decades. And um, we put together uh, this summit in the context of the Strong Start proposal the President proposed to provide universal access to preschool, high quality preschool across the country. And much like Bob said, the data is already there. We know that for every dollar we invest in, in kids getting a high quality education, that there's a, a significant return on the investment, right? Economists, et cetera, et cetera. There are pockets of innovation happening in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Who would have thought, right? There are pockets of innovation happening in the state of Georgia. Not always catching the media's attention. Uh, Boston, right? Even in LA County, right? So when First Five launched and funded LA Up, that was one of the first and largest programs dedicated to thinking about universal access to high quality preschool in the country. And as you all know, it is still a struggle here, right? It is still a struggle. So I opened up with thinking about you know, the First Lady's remarks because I thought to myself, you know, to just highlight you know, one or two places, which is hard to do, um, is a disservice to what you all are doing here. Because even in the conversation with Laura when we were opening up the, the morning, and I won't reveal what you said to me, I promise, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I asked her, well, what would you want to do if you were un un unencumbered? And she gave a response, and she's like, but I'm not the ED, I'm not the boss. And I was like, but you're the director. You're the director. She worked at Puente. And uh, long story short, I simply said to her, you know, you have tremendous power to bring about the change because you hold this role and this job and you have responsibility for all these people who are desperately looking for work to feed their families. And that's the way I sort of think about the innovation issue, which is that there are so many incredible things happening in Los Angeles. But the question becomes, for a region this large, for one of this scale and scope, how do you act in a more unified way to be more innovative and to lead the country again? Because as Bob pointed out, we have built more prisons than we have colleges, right? The UC Merced is the only place we've built. Um, and I think CSUMB in the early 90s on Monterey Bay. But the question for innovation really is how do you use the power of collective action, right? And the power of really doing things together as a sector to really transform the country and be a, a much more aggressive and much more courageous place of innovation. I'm curious what you guys all think. It, it strikes me that right now we're talking a lot about measuring impact and raising the bar. And I'm curious what you think about, as you were thinking about what would make a difference if we look out 10 years, what, did that, what does that look like for you? Just another thing to do? Or does it look like maybe there's some opportunities to do things differently? What, where did that land for you? And the nonprofit world, mm -hmm. and because uh, I know I just got back from a conference in uh, Silicon Valley where there was a lot of interaction between tech innovators and educators. Mm -hmm. It was uh, run by the Rus this Russians. I'm not even sure why I was there, but uh, it was but fascinating to me that there is there is money available for, for uh, from a for profit mm -hmm. standpoint, and how how is that um, changing the world? Do you right. think? So I, I actually do have some opinions about this because of um, not just the work at the White House, but having worked in the field for so long, which is that um, I think that where our sector has been in the past is let's put together the strategic plan to raise money from these particular high wealth individuals. And it's sort of classic development, right? The, the nonprofits that have a development officer or a vice president of development. I happen to believe personally, not on behalf of the administration, that that notion no longer is relevant. Because the way in which people engage and donate is on a micro level. I can put up a fund me page 
or I can put up my entire you know, social presence in two seconds with my $10,000 of wealth or 10 million, and I can find you or Puente in a matter of seconds. And if I'm gonna give you money, I better have a connection to that organization and I better know that there's a result for that investment, whether you call it ROI or some other uh, evaluative you know, function. I think that the, the, the challenge really is around the cross-sector solutions on money. So for example, civic hacking. How many of you heard of civic hacking before? Okay, so a couple of you. Google it, right? So there's this movement of using cross-sector um, engagement to solve social problems, sometimes on the smallest of scales. So for example, National Day of Coders. They bring together uh, uh, engineers, social media folks, technologists, average people like us, to the table and they say, let us solve with publicly available data sets a couple of key problems. So for example, if I want to have an app that could translate every pothole in the city of Los Angeles and make sure that it's tracked properly, right? Um, we could do that. We don't have to wait for the city to create that. That's an example of that. So the idea is that you would have at a table like this one or that one, people from different sectors who might not normally be traditional partners solving pothole problems that they drive in your community. And they might be in the tech sector or they might be in other sectors and they might have wealth of their own. So this notion of angel investors doesn't just come from those who are uber wealthy and or in the tech sector, which is where the, the term was coined. It happens in so many other dimensions. And what I think we, what we've done is we've let that only flourish in the private tech sectors. When in fact, if you think about the Delta sector or the social sector or the nonprofit sector, the origins of our sector come from that innovation, even from the settlement houses, right? If you think about settlement houses and the, and the notion of whole house in Chicago or the immigration centers, or you know, when you go to El Pueblo over here, I mean, you think about that particular place in the history of Los Angeles, that's where people gathered and congregated. And they were able to exchange food and culture and trade and barter. Those innovations haven't gone away We've relinquished the notion of angel investment and we've relinquished innovation to other sectors at the expense of leading that charge. So for example, when you look at the social sector report that's been released by Regina and her staff, if you look at the ability of the entire social sector in LA County, it rivals, it rivals entertainment. I, I forget what percentage, I forget the number. We've got a larger employer base here. Okay, there you go. So stop for a second and think about that. 10% of the American work workforce is working in nonprofit social sector or organizations. 10% of the American workforce. Yet the sector doesn't behave, whether it's LA County, LA City, or any number of the cities that are here, or nationally, in a way that can capture that, in, that momentum and innovation in the angel investment sectors, or angel, amongst angel investors, and bring it to the very work that you're doing. So I think that there's a ton more work to do in that space. I think that we have allowed only uber wealthy people to be engaged in angel investor conversations, when in fact our uh, history in this country tells us that that is not the way um, out of solving these big problems. Well, it sounds like you're also saying maybe there, like Bob was saying, maybe there's a window of opportunity that you sort of know what you want to accomplish and when the window opens, you jump through it. Absolutely, for that question. Thanks. I feel like angel investors have, because they um, maybe have been donors for a longer period of their lifetime or they have more money to let go of, it's a little bit easier to tell them, like, you know, we're, we're not going to follow the 15% rule. Mm -hmm. We're not going to only pay our staff 15% in our overhead because that's not what they're worth. Right. And as we all know, we play with the budget numbers or whatever, and your director goes into programs, whatever. It doesn't matter. So I feel like it's harder to convince micro donors and corporate partners that you need to pay your director of programs more than $35,000 a year because they're doing a job of right. somebody who in the private sector would be paying, getting paid 70000 So how do you translate mm -hmm. some of those core values mm -hmm. that I feel like angel investors are more willing to accept because they can take risks mm -hmm. with their funds, mm -hmm. whereas the millennials are 10 to to $100 donors per month, which equals a lot at the end of the year, but they're sort of like, oh, that's, that's like my beer money. You know, that's right. like, right? right? I mean, because right. it's a smaller right. percentage of theirs. So how do you 
translate that. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you were asking the question, I went to, you know, the, the very long nights of having to run a budget and, and fudging those numbers myself. So it's like, you know, let, let us all admit that we all do that. So when I got to, when I worked at the Annie Casey Foundation, I became a grant maker. I sort of laughed because it's, it's, it's the biggest um, charade in the country. It is, it is the biggest money laundering scheme in the country. Call it what it is. <laughs> because we all know who have run nonprofit organizations, or even in government, when I work in government, when, and I gave money through government, that this notion of the overhead myth is just ridiculous, right? How do you morally justify paying someone minimum wage and have them qualify for the very social services that the clients are coming to get? One, right? Two, generationally, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, the sort of the generation lost between millennials and the boomers. And I will say, forgive me for a second, I say this, there is a generational difference between how service and compensation is treated in this country. Do not ask me. To, I have to provide for my family. So do not ask me because you might have a private trust fund and can work for zero to a few thousand dollars a year to, ex me to feed, expect me to feed my family on that, given the background that I came from. So there are these myths that have happened to have taken over our sector. And I think that the, the most direct and honest response, which I'm hopefully giving, is you have to take it head on, which is the person who's your angel investor, if they're a billionaire, a millionaire, or just have a, a couple loose dollars to spare, as you said, they're no smarter necessarily on the issues than you are on this. And if they have the misperception that you can feed the homeless of Los Angeles for you know, roughly 15% a year, then, then maybe you don't want them as your angel investor. And that courage to be able to have an honest conversation and to take them along sort of the educational process is really critical. Why? because the pendulum swung so far when foundations wanted to launch Parity Navigator, right? So to, to, to only look at what was your percentage of overhead. And it's just not true. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to absolve ourselves of the responsibility to hold ourselves to account for results for the money in which we are investing in our teams, right? And we know that that's really critical. So using you know, solid financial tools, which our sector has not always been the best at, being accountable and transparent for the way in which dollars are invested, those are the places where there's even more innovation to come in our sector. I think one of the things that I thought a lot about and did and at, at great pain uh, and sacrifice and, and tripping on tripwires was trying to consolidate services and sharing costs in the sector to bulk purchase things. And I bet you money that if we did a survey right now of all of you, that very few of you actually work together across boards and across nonprofits and purchase virtually, you probably purchase close to nothing together, right? But what if you did? What if amongst tables or amongst, you know, in your spas, you actually got together and put your egos aside, because I, I had to do this in order to save budgets and figure out where do we shape? In Baltimore, when I ran, I was in the mayor's cabinet in Baltimore and I ran the, the largest nonprofit that served children and families. And there were these, at the time, major transitions in organizations that served. And we ended up going in, one of my board members ran the mental health program for all of Baltimore City. And we ended up uh, breaking every mold and breaking every you know, fight that came our way to share a, um, you know, a talent management person. And we came up with an arrangement on how we were going to share, sort of think about human resources differently. That wasn't like groundbreaking innovative. It was at the time in Baltimore. But the idea was that we can do that as a sector, and we don't. And so how do you bulk purchase paper? How do you negotiate larger contracts with the federal government, with the county government? How do you, you know, use all the tools that are available to you, to us, to me, in a very different and powerful way so that you have more flexibility to provide incentives for your employees? You know, or how do you use the quote unquote profit that you earn at the end, when you're just squeaking by, to be able to buy your staff some books and treat them to a movie. I mean, these are tools, by the way, that are exactly how the private sector works. So the incentive structure, you know, as long as you're ethical, right, why wouldn't we treat all of you, all of our employees, the same way and honor the sector for what it is, which is trying to transform people's lives? It may take longer to get there, but the work of doing that is no less easier 
than any other sector, so why don't we think about it differently in that way? I think we have somebody back sure. in the front. Albert Taroka, Executive Director of Diverse Scholar. We work on faculty diversity efforts, especially creating more Latino mm -hmm. professors. So my experience comes from, from that background. Mm -hmm. My concern, returning back to the topic of being data-driven, mm -hmm. is that that can actually suppress innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our organizations are just struggling to actually provide our services. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the capacity to generate data or analyze data mm -hmm. to these new data-driven mm -hmm. expectations, mm -hmm. that then we're being penalized for mm -hmm. not having data about our new innovative ideas. Okay. So how do we balance the expectation yeah. for data and ROI with an innovative idea? So. Um, I have a great uh, example of something I, that I did at first five, and I'm going to tie it back to uh, Albert, right? Albert, to Albert's question. But if you look at today's, whatever you get in the hotel, the USA Today, mm -hmm. there's a whole half a page article on Google's diversity. So Google that. And, um, <laughs> but here's what's fascinating about that, because I've actually, uh, uh, they uh, were being asked to share their data on how diverse or not the Google workforce was. They were the first tech company to do it after many years of resistance. And lo and behold, probably not a huge surprise to everyone in the room, predominantly male, male white, and then male Asian, few women, I, I could be mis wrong, but look it up, 3% Latino, 2% African American. And uh, in a workforce, right, mostly millennials, and Gen Xers, who have the largest diversity in the nation's history. And so the question became, if Google is to meet its mission of reflecting the diversity of America, how might it go about diversifying its workforce differently? Not simply for the numbers, but because the, the idea that we leave no community behind, right? that we give no one our back. right? And quite frankly, it's a good business model. Because every one of us in this room, and most people in our communities, have some version of the many phones that we carry. right? So I use that as an example, so you should take a look at it, right? Because the, the social sector has that same challenge. So when I was at Casey, uh, one of the portfolios I led was for the whole foundation was capacity building for nonprofits. And we were doing talent pipeline work. Well, we should take a look in the mirror about the social sector, because even though this room is pretty diverse, at the time, so I guess three years ago, and I could be off by the numbers, 91% of foundation executives and their senior teams were white. 91% of the nation's foundation teams, right? Executives. The majority of nonprofits in this country at the executive or president and CEO low level now are, are, are similar, something like 84%. The idea here isn't to say, oh, you know, oh, that's so horrible just because of, you know, it's all white. The idea is that who are they serving and how are we creating a pipeline for the next generation of leaders, right? In the social sector and in the country. And the thing that struck out at me, uh, stuck out at me, was that there was often this resistance in, and I'm not saying, Albert, that you are resistant to it, uh, given the sort of the capacity issue, but of saying, we don't have enough staff to do the data, therefore we can't do the data. And I, I would say, if we don't do the data in the way that it works for Albert or your organization, you are out of the game, because the train on data has left the station a long time ago. And at first five, we had this, we were, this is years ago, we were trying to figure out how to share data amongst nonprofit organizations who had similar clients. So you know the story, a poor person has to go to XYZ ABC organization to get TANF here, to get Help Medi-Cal here, to get out of school time services here, to get a shelter voucher here, or HEAP or whatever. And it's like telling the same story over and over and over and over to multiple organizations, which by the way, wrote them down and the staff talked anyways, or gossiped, however you want to frame it, right? <laughs> now, that wasn't protecting their privacy, but we tried to launch and we did a, 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 a virtual way to do that. There was massive resistance, massive resistance from every single grantee that we funded. Turns out, when you scratch the surface a little, it wasn't privacy, it was the fact that, sadly, at the time, most nonprofit caseworkers did not know how to use the internet and could not use Excel. When we found that out, we paid for a community college to actually teach staff how to use Excel and how to use the internet. And that was 2000, so 15 years ago. I mean, this was the real deal. So Albert's point of, you know, we didn't have the capacity, I get that, I, I, I really do, but I feel like if we are to be 
the transformative sector, the delta sector that Bob has referred to, or that we can be in a much more strategic way, we have to figure out, back to shared services, how do we think about sharing these resources that Albert doesn't feel left alone and without capacity? Could three of you with Albert figure out how to share that data person? Could you hire a $55,000 a year, $75,000 a year top statistician? Could you approach USC, UCLA, or any of these CSUs or the community colleges to do you know, data analysis for Albert's group, right? Using the graduate school or undergraduate projects. And I'm giving ideas of actually just, not just ideas, things I've done and worked and have also failed at. Like the number of times I invested in any number of the ideas, some of them worked beautifully, some of them failed miserably. But I, I happen to be a believer that data does drive an agenda, so I agree with Bob there. It does not solve it because there's actually a moral compass or moral responsibility. And I do happen to believe that we don't, as a country, or as a city, or as a county, however you want to frame it, often take the risk of the political will necessary to bring about that change. Much the way in which, if you literally walk down a couple of blocks, you know, you could see a whole bunch of homeless families. And I'll never forget, my first week on the job, back to Gloria Molina, I kept hearing the reference of um, Skid Row. And I was her senior health and human services deputy. So I was like, well, I should find out what Skid Row means. And I thought it was a saying. And that Saturday, I walked around what really is Skid Row in Los Angeles. And I was mortified because one of the first people I encountered was a woman with her infant child in the bassinet at the corner. And and I remember thinking, like, I went back and asked on Monday, well, what is the data on what we know about these families? And interestingly, we know, we, at that time, we knew virtually nothing. Be yet that woman, this mother and her baby, were already in multiple county systems, right? So the data piece, Albert, is a complicated one. I think it's a powerful and important question. But I, I would urge us all to not let the challenge of capacity, which is real, and I get that, outstrip the power of actually using data to at least navigate the political systems in which we operate. You know, I, I, you're reminding me that one of the things that you all said in our sector snapshot was that 73% of you are using evaluation. So somebody's out there doing it. You're using it for three things. The majority of you say that you're using it really around best practice. Are you getting the result you want? There was about a third of you that said, I'm using it because a funder's making me. Mm -hmm. But the interesting part that I thought, hmm, it hadn't really occurred to me, I think it was just around 12, maybe 15% of you said you use it for performance appraisals mm -hmm. to develop staff. I thought, what an interesting thought mm -hmm. that we're combining best practice at the macro level, mm -hmm. really, with the micro expectations to develop staff expectations. Mm -hmm. Oddly, though, when we ask the question again, um, as Jessica is want to do, she'll come at it from a couple of different ways, you said, we don't have the capacity, we don't know how to do it, and um, we don't have staff or money. So, But to your mm -hmm. point, it sounds like there's no turning back. It's that, that we need these sorts of measurements. So then it's just different ways. And, right. you know, Jim Ferris will talk later, coming from USC, you know, there's lots of different ways to get data. And there's a lot yeah. of different ways to tell Absolutely. stories. I, I don't want to disconnect from you guys asking your questions. So let's get back to you. He's here, actually. I saw him. Oh. Thanks. Um, I'm Vicki Foxworth with Executive Service Corp. <coughs> We've been using groups of students from USC um, who are taking consulting classes out of the Marshall School of Business mm -hmm. to help us gather the data um, and put that together. And it's been very effective. That said, it does still take a lot of staff time, mm -hmm. but it definitely has given us a tremendous amount of data that we can use in a variety of ways. And there are professors that we work with specifically. So I'm happy to share that information. Um, What's your name? Sir. Oh, Vicki Foxworth. Oh, Vicki. Look for Vicki later on. And, and I will say, you're sort of reminding me of, have you heard of the term citizen science? So it's an, an interesting movement, right? There's some nods heading. So if you think about 
uh, in the history of the country of cataloging like species of trees. Someone had to go around and like say, oh, this is an elm, this is an oak, this is the wisteria, right? Well, th now <laughs> with, true, right, it really happened. There are um, groups across the country, and there are even some nascent groups here in LA, that are using citizen science, the notion that everyone can observe, capture, and share information that is actually helping transform how we think about weather and climate change nationally. Um, levels of, of species around a riverbank. So you think about Cyclavia, Cic I forget how it's pronounced. Olivia. Yeah, how cool, right. That notion, <laughs> 10 years ago, I mean, I, I chuckle because you all know that everyone drives like one block around here. I mean, I, 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 I walked from City Hall to the county building for a meeting yesterday, and, and they were like, you walked? And I said, I did walk. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, and I, because we know that story <coughs> here, right? So the notion of like how we use bikes, right? How people are reporting the re-engagement of public spaces and the work that's being done around the Army Corps of Engineers and the waterway and taking back the river, right? All these things, though political and sort of macro level changes, have a citizen science component that led to them. So I would say let us not forget about that potential too because there are so many ways, including our own clients, the people that we serve. You know, how do we engage them to help us solve some of these challenges? How do we engage other people from other sectors? We had the first ever White House tech meetup a couple of um, months ago, and I was on the team that brought the CEO and founder of Meetup, and we brought in the meetup organizers across the country who had the largest followings and meetups in the entire country, and we brought in social sector leaders from everything from like, uh, you know, entrepreneurial businesses in Harlem, to you know, Indian reservation, you know, realignment of how they're sharing culture and, and dances. And it was fascinating because through Tech Meetup, you can actually, if you haven't used it, I mean, you can organize a group anywhere. You can tap into the thousands of meetup groups that are here in LA. What is stunning about it is that there are all these people who would never go to a board of supervisors meeting or even be in this kind of a room who will work with you to solve your challenge. They just approach it from a completely different angle. Whether it's the, 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 the meetup component or the citizen science concept, these tools of engaging others from across sectors and from across our communities are really powerful. And that's where I think the innovation is going to happen with this sector, is how do we leverage resources in a completely new and different way, using as a platform technology to do it, and never losing sight of the human connection necessary to build trust and engagement and love between people that you're serving. I'm curious if anybody here feels they kind of have that evaluation tracking thing wired. Are there some content experts? Yes, I'm Would you stand go. up? <laughs> Not to embarrass you, let me tell you why I'm asking. We're going to have a lunch break pretty soon. And for all of you that think it's impossible, we have some content experts among us. So let's find out from them what we can take advantage of those smart people while we're here together. You, you might not be t totally pleased with what I have to say about it, but I agree that there, so I'm a statistician and, I, and a scholar, and before I was in the nonprofit sector, I was a researcher and really believe very, very strongly in research-driven practice. And we use it fairly efficiently and without a huge amount of cost to, for best practices. But where it falls apart for me, and I think it's really an important issue, across the sector is the solution seems to always come back and turn in on the nonprofits to be accountable and prove their impact and accountability. And there's an inherent conflict with that. Um, just like in education, if I put a teacher's salary contingent on performance and then ask her to evaluate or pay for the evaluation of her performance, then I think that we have a validity issue. And so I think that it is uh, important mm -hmm. for Can, for can you speak back into your microphone, please? I, I think it's not, it's going in and out, but I, oh, okay. Um, I, so I, we have a validity issue, right? Same with a medical professional. So if the funders continue to make evaluation contingent, you know, impact and prove, you know, contingent on support, we have a real problem in the sector. And so for us to be taking all of that on um, internally while possible, and hopefully we're all very integrous, 
it's still not best practices. So I'm not sure we should be advocating beyond research and performance review in certain aspects of our work, which we're absolutely accountable for internally. As a sector, we should also be advocating for, uh, for systems in place that are not, uh, that are not inherently conflicted. So I mean, I didn't just say for the record, I'm not saying that the other sectors have no responsibilities. If I learned anything when I worked at the Annie Casey Foundation for three years, it was an eye-opener when you pull back that curtain, having written grants my entire life to places like Casey and others, and then being there, right? So the philanthropic sector um, historically has not been very accountable to anybody but their boards. And even at that, as Bob said, it's a struggle. So let's, be clear, let's just name that elephant in the room, number one. Number two, the, the, the question then, I think, at the heart of what you're saying, if I heard you, uh, is that, you know, no, the social sector or nonprofit shouldn't be responsible for figuring it out. No, they shouldn't. However, the question should be then, what do you want? Because when I say the train has left the station, philanthropy, that's where it is. So you cannot get a grant from any major foundation without some version of a results framework. They all have different names, right? Logic models, results, outcomes, it's some version. And if I could offer like one thought about this, if you look at you know, Mark Friedman's results-based accountability, if you strip away all the terms, there are three questions that are asked that I think are really relevant, which is how much did you do, how well did you do it, and is anybody better off? And those three questions you could ask universally in just about any community, people get that language. Because whether or not you are reporting to a government or a foundation, or some other funder, you better be able to tell that to the people you're serving for ethical and moral reasons. So if you say, you need to come to my organization because I'm going to help you get a job, we shouldn't be counting how many referrals you had. We should be counting, did you get a job? Did you help provide for your family? And if you're a nonprofit that can't do that, you should be out of business. And that kind of clarity is what I think our own sector, our sector has been afraid to hold ourselves accountable for. Because we know the competition for dollars. We know that this is tough. And if you can't produce results, get out of the game. So I say, what if, if not that, and if not just our sector, then what would our sector want? What, what would it look like? What would it look like for LA County? What if you set the standard for the nation? What if you said, here is our two, three examples. Try them, for God's sake. Put a stake in the ground somewhere. And say, what could it look like if we did X? What might it look like if we tried why? And really set the course for the country in a very different and profound ways. And again, there are pockets of that here, don't get me wrong. There are pockets across the country. Cities are testing this, counties are testing this, philanthropic organizations are testing it. But if you ask some version of the, what I think are those three basic questions, if you can't go home at night and ask those, answer those right now, today, for your organization, you're in trouble, both for the funders to whom you have to go for more money, and also the people that are, are relying on you. Right? All of you, I looked at many of your websites in preparation for thinking about who's going to be in the room. Regina sent them to me, and I was struck by the enormous diversity of what you have online. You know, having myself had to create websites just when websites were the thing to do. Right? It's hard to maintain. Right? It's, it's costly. But some of you have some really amazing websites. Others, like, you need to take a few minutes to look at what you have <laughs> online. Just a few minutes. <laughs> so, Regina, did you want the other uh, research person? Yes. Sure. Since I've got the microphone. So, so I'm Mike Olnick. I'm, I'm the CEO of the Child Care Resource Center that's uh, based in the San Fernando Valley. Um, we cover everything north and also San Bernardino County. Uh, we've had a research department for the last dozen years, and we built it up from one person to now a dozen people. We build research into everything that we do, and we use it for advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, child care has been sort of on the chopping block for the last five years at the state, and most of our funding comes from there. And, and what you said about trying to get people to understand that uh, child care helps people work, we actually did a study and looked at how much we were spending on child care and how much parents were earning on child care, and it's about two and a half dollars for every dollar that's being spent just in our area. Mm -hmm. We also map every, but every provider, every child, er, and we do that by all the districts, um, senatorial, assembly districts, and go to the Sacramento and use it for advocacy. So, uh, and it's been very effective. I do have a comment about evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. 
Everybody talks about evidence-based, which means that somebody did a study somewhere and did it. And, it, and we've, I've heard a number of times this morning about innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, evidence-based practice doesn't allow you to do innovation because you've got to do something that's already been proven to work. Mm -hmm. So where's the encouragement for innovation going to come from? You know, that's a complicated one, a, a really good question, because it's something that I've worked on and struggled with. And one of the teams I was on was the White House Office of Social Innovation and Participation which oversees the Corporation for National Community Service, which translation gives all the AmeriCorps money, right? AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, et cetera. And there's a Social Innovation Fund, which I'm sure you know about, the SIF. And there's been you know, wild opinions about how innovative or not it's been, right? Uh, my sense, though, is that if you look at it, if you sort of take a step way back and say, in the history of our country, when the pendulum swings, like sort of where does it swing, right? Sometimes it's an extreme. So whenever I hear EBP, or evidence-based practice, I put on my Watsonville, California hat. And if you ever drive up north, right, it's you know, in Santa Cruz County, so it's just it's the southern tip, or it's you know, 30 miles north of Monterey. Little agricultural town, ton of stuff we grow, you know, vegetables, fruits, flowers, et cetera. And it never makes, ever, any major study. It's too little like to have um, you know, statistically significant impact. Right? These are terms that we are, all know. It is a combination of rural and suburban because of the wealth that comes from Silicon Valley and buys homes and commutes over the Santa Cruz Mountains every day. It has these dramatically divergent populations that are both um, highly educated on the northern part of the county and uh, very little formal education in the southern tip where I was born and raised, where most people come from, most but not all, They've come from a series of, of countries, Mexico being the latest, but Yugoslavia before, and Portugal, and, and uh, Philippine, Filipino families, and Chinese families, and many of which did not have a formal education. I say all this to say that EVPs um, are the latest swing in the pendulum, and if I could extract one piece that matters immensely, it's that it forced all of us to think about what does work. Now, in an ideal world, right, you'd say, I run the Child Care Resource Center in San Fernando Valley, and I have my research and data that says, if you invest in these three points for all kids in the San Fernando Valley, you will have these outcomes at high school and college, or whatever your metric is. Invest in me versus these two people. Logic would say, yes, sir, your data and research points to it. These two don't have it. I'm going to take the money I fund them and fund you. That's the logic behind the movement. But people ha don't have often the political will to do that. Why? Because funding, generally from the cities, counties, states, federal government, um, often have come from a history of asked through legislative bills, right? So think about years ago, I mean, you could actually sneak into a bill in California, I'm not sure if you can do it anymore, um, or at the federal level and say, I'm going to fund this bridge in Watsonville, or which we did, and I literally wrote the memo, we were <laughs> going to fund, I'm not kidding, we were going to fund a mixed-use project, which is now live, to use a third of an acre parcel to serve as the metro bus center, farm worker housing, and a child care center. And we got money from the Packard Foundation uh, to help do some of the work. And we wrote in, we literally worked, we drove to Sacramento, and we got in a piece of money when, uh, I forget who it was at the time, Peter Fruset or someone, uh, to actually get state money. So we got like, you know, pork barrel. That's how we did it. I don't know if you still do that now, but that's how we did it. I'm telling you all this to say also that, you know, that pendulum hasn't quite swung back and figured it out. And so I, my own take is, having worked on those issues, that not everyone's going to have an evidence-based uh, project that is worth studying, because not everything should be studied in that way. But two, we all have the capacity to collect basic data on what you're doing to help inform best practices. And I think that is where the next generation is going to move, because an EVP in Trenton, New Jersey, does not an EVP make in you know, South LA, necessarily, right? Different geography, different populations, et cetera. And I think that when people are taking a model that is um, tested in one area and trying it in a new uh, geography around cultural and linguistic issues, it's not always going to have the same results. And if, you, if, you, if anyone in this room who is not these two folks who are researchers or statisticians take a moment to look at some of the literature that's wildly available on Google, you will learn that most evidence-based work is done with very heterogeneous populations, 
because it's where EVPs work best, which is when we are all the same, whatever community you are, right? So I think there are some loopholes, there are some holes in our collective thinking about EVPs. And oftentimes it just takes courage, maybe yours or hers, to sort of poke holes um, wherever you can around the logic, because I think that we are trying to figure out as a country how to use um, evidence in general to be smarter about policy making. And there are some great, there's some great work happening in this space. Um, Harlem Children's Zone, for all its accolades and criticism, Jeff Canada, and I've seen the actual table, created for the first time in that part of New York a dashboard using metrics, very basic, that tracked countless data points on every one of the kids that come into the Harlem Children's Zone. No one had ever done that before, right? So just for a second, think about it. That wasn't, like, it was ground, that wasn't like groundbreaking. He invented the light bulb. But what Jeff did was do that for Harlem Children's Zone. And they can tell you on every given day, Ann williams Eisen is the new CEO, and she's a dear friend of mine. We were Casey fellows together. I, I've seen her, she, they track, they can tell you every single kid exactly what's happening to their family and exactly what's happening to them. And th that, right, two ends of the spectrum, right? But there's a lot of criticism of what the Harlem Children's Zone can or can't do and what is or is not replicable. I say when you go visit and you actually get into the weeds of what they do, and that they're able to tell you that for this family and these kids and these babies, whether it's baby college or preschool or their charter school, they know exactly what's happening to every one of those kids. And that's the kind of discipline that I would hope we would take from the EBP conversations, that it takes a different kind of discipline to make sure we are all engaged and helping change lives in the most powerful way. Well, and it sounds like the kind of universal wish is mm -hmm. that you have a strategy and you know what you're, where you're trying to go, what Absolutely. kind of impact you're trying Absolutely. to have. I could do this all afternoon, but I mean, you guys might want to have lunch eventually. Yep. So I want to say thank you sure. so much for coming out. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all you do.